Good afternoon, I'm Victor Zhao, the President of the National Academy of Medicine. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this pre-workshop event titled, A Century After 1918 Influenza Pandemic, Why Are We Still Concerned Today? First, I apologize that I cannot be with you in person for this very important event, but I'm glad I have a chance to talk to you. As you know, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic, one of the deadliest disease outbreaks in history. It is estimated about 500 million people, or one third of the world's population, became infected with this virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide. Now, since then, scientific medical advances with better hygiene, antibiotic, diagnostic and vaccines have given us far more effective tools for prevention responding to infectious outbreaks. Yet, we continue to see devastating outbreaks. In the last several decades, we've seen several large-scale recurring and emerging infectious threats, such as cholera, yellow fever, Ebola, SARS, and Zika, and many others. Unfortunately, there are no signs that these trends will fade because factors such as global population growth, migration, climate change, urbanization, and increased human-animal contact are contributing greatly to the problem. It's only a matter of time before we see the next outbreak. So the question is whether the world is ready to respond to the next outbreak. Our keynote speaker, Laurie Garrett, will speak about this very shortly. But I would say that recent experience would suggest the world is ill-prepared for infectious crisis. The 2014 Ebola outbreak was a big, big wake-up call. There were failures in response at almost every level, local, regional, international, and the community. Ultimately, the crisis was contained, but the cost in human lives and economic and social disruption was just enormous, with over 28,000 cases and over 11,000 deaths. More recently, the Democratic Republic of Congo declared an outbreak on Ebola on August 2018, the second outbreak in this country. As of November 13th, there have been 341 cases, including 215 deaths. Although the first outbreak was controlled fairly quickly, the current outbreak response has been complicated due to ongoing conflict in the region. This is causing tremendous concern of an uncontrolled outbreak. Peter Selimer, who has the WHO response program, suggested it would take at least another six months to contain the outbreak. No doubt they have their challenges cut out for them. Now, Ebola killed thousands and devastated communities, and yet the outcome could have been much worse because Ebola is not airborne, it's not extremely contagious. Imagine the devastation that would occur if a highly contagious disease outbreak occurred. Bill Gates has said that a pandemic flu that spread between humans very effectively in the modern era would be in all urban centers across the globe within days and would kill 33 million people in 250 days. So the stakes are high and they're higher than ever and we need to step up our efforts to be prepared. What do we need to do? Since the 2014 Ebola outbreak, National Academy of Medicine, as well as the WHO, the Harvard and London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, and United Nations High Level Panel have all generated reports assessing what went wrong and how infectious disease outbreaks should be better managed. The good news is some of these challenges have been addressed through the creation of WHO Contingency Fund, the development of the World Bank, PEF, Pandemic Emergency Facility Financing, and the establishment of CEPI. However, many issues remain. For example, what is the global governance to bolster preparedness for pandemic influenza? Now, the Ebola reports, especially the UN Secretary General's Task Force, recommended a more effective and independent mechanism for monitoring. At this meeting, David Fidler will take a critical look into IHR and pandemic influenza preparedness frameworks. 
they will tell you that IHR requires voluntary self-assessment and report in 196 member states. And unfortunately, as you all know, compliance has been poor. A number of other reports have been launched to improve monitoring and assessment of country preparedness. WHO in February 2016 developed the external evaluation tool, JEE, to externally evaluate countries' preparedness and capacity. To date, 70 to 80 countries have undergone JEE, but the gaps are really large and there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly in low-income countries. Most recently, respond to UN high-level panel's recommendation for a time-limited, more effective and independent mechanism of monitoring that WHO Tedros and the World Bank Jim Kim co-convened two planning committees in December 2017 and March 2018 in which I participated. The planning meetings resulted in the creation of an independent global preparedness monitoring board called GPMB. The board co-chaired by Gro Harlem Brundtland and Mr. Eli Asai comprise of 14 high-level members across relevant stakeholders with public and private sector experience. I'm very privileged to be serving as a member of this board. We met for the first time in Geneva in September 2018. At that meeting, we determined the function of the board are to serve as the key high-level body advising global health crisis preparedness, monitoring and updating the world. Second, strategically prioritize gaps in preparedness, Third, advocate the highest political levels, G7, G20, UN Security Council, General Assembly, Davos, etc., and to develop a global health crisis preparedness monitoring framework that will pre provide a single authoritative roadmap. This framework will be organized around four content domains. First, strengthening public health capacity. Second, monitoring progress of relevant research and development, including the R&D blueprint and the recent World Bank convened International Vaccine Task Force. Next is the monitoring preparedness of financing, both public and private, and finally generating risk analysis, including economic social vulnerabilities based on reliable assessment from stakeholders and partners. The board will galvanize community and national ownership, including through advocacy efforts for legislation, regulation, and policies. And it will del deliver these functions across global, regional, and local systems. To accomplish this goal, GPMB will recruit a seasoned secretariat and commission key reports synthesizing state-of-the-art on the status preparedness and to publish annually a report on the status of global preparedness health crisis accompanied by significant efforts in communication. Now, GPMB is to establish for an initial period of five years with no expectation of continuation should there be no further demand for such a board. While monitoring is critically important, other issues and questions remain as we think about preparing and preventing the next epidemic and pandemic. We must better understand the biology of virus to help us prepare for the future. Influenza is so adept at evolving. A better understanding of the dynamics of the virus evolution will bring insight into flu transmission, adaptation new hosts, and outbreak potential. This will be discussed in some detail by Yoshihiro Kawaoka. Another critical question is whether we're close to universal flu vaccine. We know the protectability of any flu vaccine depends on researchers to correctly predict which form will dominate the season. And then there's issue mutation, which can make vaccination much less effective. That's why a flu vaccine, a universal flu vaccine, is such an attractive concept. And you'll hear from Tony Fauci about NIAID's effort in this area. Finally, we must examine the evolution and benefits of One Health as a unifying theme for pandemic influenza preparedness. Influenza is a perfect example of why One Health approach is critical disease prevention response. And pandemic preparedness depends on breakdown, breaking down the walls between animal, human, and environmental sectors. 
as we move forward, we must use a one health approach to prevent multidisciplinary threats like influenza pandemics. And you hear about this issue from Jackie Katz and CDC very shortly. So improving pandemic preparedness will require sustained attention to collective action across many sectors. This is why I'm so pleased to see all of you come together for this workshop. I'd like to thank the organizing committee, Gabriel Lerm, KG Fakuda, uh, Larry Gostin, David Raumann, and Nancy Cox, as well as the staff for putting together such a terrific event. I'm hopeful that today's discussion will highlight recent progress as well as the steps needed to prepare for the next pandemic. Again, thank you all for coming, and I wish you a most successful meeting. Thank you.